This episode is brought to you by Summer School Electronics. With pedals like the Snow Day Delay, the Pep Rally Fuzz, the Trash Panda, and my personal favorite, the Science Fair, which is two classic dirt pedals in one with a mid-boosted overdrive on one side, a black lab rat circuit on the other, and a blend knob to blend between them to find the perfect classic stacked dirt sound you're looking for, it's hard not to find something you'll love. Mark builds all of his pedals by hand in Syracuse, New York, where he also works as a full-time educator. In addition to the super fun graphics on their pedals, Mark also offers custom artwork. Want your dog's face on a pedal? He can do it. Want your face on a pedal? He can make that happen too. Go over to summerschoolelectronics.com and make sure to tell them that 40 Watt Podcast sent you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of 40 Watt Podcast. My name is Philip. I am your host. I am super pumped to be here, but I think I say that every week. I'm always pumped to be here. I'm just happy to be doing this and doing something. You know how it is. So before we get kicked off in the conversation that I'm super excited about because the pre-episode conversation has been great too, so I just know the episode's going to be amazing, uh, which also means that the in-between episode, you know, before between the main episode and the Patreon episode is going to be even better and it's going to be full of things I can't even talk about because they're not public information. But it usually means that both episodes are going to be great. Do you want to hear both episodes? Well, there's one way to hear both episodes you got to go over to patreon.com slash 40 watt podcast and support the podcast at $5 a month or more. The extra episode every week, well, every week that there's a main episode is super fun. It's usually more fun because by then the guests have warmed up, especially first time guests and conversation gets a little crazy. So if you want to do that, go over to patreon.com slash 40 watt podcast and you can support this podcast like these wonderful people. Benjamin Rodway, Jamie Evans, Henry Klubikowski, Brian May, but not that Brian May, Heinrich Nordvang of Nordvang Custom Pedals, Tony DeGraw, Steve Rao of 60 Cycle Hum, Julie McFarling of Labland Photography, Abe Matthews, Duncan Watson, Andy Johns, David Evangelista of the Guitar Dads Podcast, Blake Jefferson, Nick Call, Andrew Hensley, Alan Gresham, our own Dan Pilver of Lewitt Audio, Scott Hamilton of the 60 Cycle Hum Podcast, Giacomo Ride, Andy Koning, Jim Burns, Tom Kelly, Heath Bat, Ben Fair of Electromotive Sound Co., uh, Rick Calhoun of Honey Picks, Jeffrey Walks, and Kyle Harris. Thank you all for your continued support. Uh, I genuinely can't say enough amazing things about all of you, so I appreciate it. Uh, into the main episode, speaking of, uh, as we just mentioned, this week I've got Dan Pilver of Lewitt Audio on the podcast. How are you doing, Dan? I'm great. How are you? Man, I'm good. I am, I'm, I'm having a good day. It's, it's been a good week. Air's getting cooler down here finally. Um, I woke up to 30 and 40 degree weather the last couple of days and, uh, it feels great not to be sweating 100% of the time. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I think, 35 this morning. There was some snow in the, uh, Northwest corner of Connecticut where I live. So oh, it'll wow. be that time of year. I'm kind of surprised it yep. was that quick, but we're cool. a long way away from snow if it even happens at all. But you know, it, it'd be nice. I like the snow down here because if we get it, it's here for a day and then it's gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't, we don't have to deal with weeks and weeks of shoveling driveways and stuff like that. Yeah. we. But uh, it does mean it gets drier here for guitars out in rooms. <clears throat> Yeah, I just filled up my humidifier for the first time since the spring this morning. So great, great. Something to <laughs> monitor. I have three nice acoustics. So um, I'm like <laughs> always stressing out about that because the, I, the yeah. humidity fluctuates here from anywhere from 60% on a you know late fall day all the way to, you know, one <laughs> when it's bitter cold. <laughs> So. Yeah, it doesn't quite get that dry here, but it is starting to dry out a little bit, and it will throughout the winter. So I'm ordering a new humidifier. I've sort of piecemealed it the past few years. I do have a hygrometer in the room, but mm-hmm. I I have looked at a few new uh, humidifiers, especially those with the uh, evaporative uh, mm-hmm. humidifiers, so that I don't have to deal with the white dust everywhere on everything. But yep, I don't have... I have two really nice acoustics. One isn't even here right now because it's at a it's at a tech getting a little touch up and work done. So, but I, I worry about them all. 
mm-hmm. all my babies. So that's a really ridiculous statement. Guitars are not animate objects. Y'all, they're tools. Don't listen to him. They're all your babies. <laughs> But so. having said that, y'all, it is about that season. Be sure to your humidity. Go go to Walmart and buy a twenty or thirty dollar hygrometer so you know what the humidity in your room mm-hmm. with your guitars is. It's very important. Yep, and a lot of so, the time, humidifiers. Do, <clears throat> if a humidifier has a hygrometer on it, uh, it's not super accurate. So, oh yeah, don't, yeah, don't trust the one on the humidifier. Nope. Don't listen. It's all lies. No. Yeah. A, a lot of the reviews that we're reading were saying things like, oh, well, it says 55%, but my hygrometer in the room says it's only 47%. Well, if it's consistently that, you know that you need to bump up what you tell the, the humidifier to get to. Uh, so it's it's a thing. It Trust me, you don't want to see some of the gnarly acoustic problems I've seen from people who don't humidify uh, mm-hmm. their rooms. Uh, and I don't like leaving guitars in cases, so I need to humidify the room because a, a guitar in a case doesn't get played. Exactly. Same. Yeah. If it's, if I can't grab it without having to go through a process, I don't grab it. Exactly. I, heck, most of my cases are in a storage unit, um, because they take up so much room. Yeah. I'm a gig bag user. Everything. You know, it could be my, Same. yeah, it could be my, you know, $6,000 PRS or my $300 Squire Rascal Bass, and it's like, <laughs> they're all in the same bags. Exactly. Uh, speaking of bags, you need to tell me where I can find a bag that fits a Firebird. <laughs> uh, you know, the Gator Bass Bags. Do fits. they? Yeah, the the slightly more expensive one. The ones that, um, <clears throat> the ones that, like, you can get them in, like, a blue, like, blue textile or black textile. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one right behind me. I'll grab it in a few, but. I'll show you after. Yeah, I but. have one of the I have one of the harder case gator base mm-hmm. bags. Um, but it's not quite it I call it a bag, but it's more mm-hmm. like a soft case. Uh yeah. it doesn't quite have the headstock room. So you're talking about the bags, the mm-hmm. actual gig bags. Yeah, they sell for like 150 bucks. They're great. Okay. Cause I really want to try it. I also want to look at um I, I don't like I don't trust mono gig bags with angled headstocks, if I'm really honest. I think they're too soft. Yep. Um, I like the, um, I really love the Reunion Blues gig bags, though. I did a video comparing the two, and I really love the Reunion Blues, but I haven't ever seen one of their base ones, so I don't know if it would fit in there or not either, so. Yep, I've never seen a base one either, so. Yeah, yeah. I need to try it. I need to try a bunch of stuff. So, let's let's get started on a few things. So, I, it's, I bring up the Firebird, because that's partially your fault. Um, <laughs> uh, we talked a whole bunch in that process when I was searching for a Firebird. And uh, I, I had to get that one when I found it and I got the offer that I got on it, which was wild. Um, but you had, since the last time you were on the podcast, you've had a few things come in. And uh, I, I want to talk specifically about the train wreck. Yeah. So you've had it for a little while now. Uh, mm-hmm. So tell the listeners about, uh, you know, I'm sure most of our listeners know all about train wreck, but give them like the the elevator pitch version and then what made you want to spend that much on an amplifier <laughs> sure so for anybody who's not familiar with train wreck amps um if you've listened to a fish record in the last couple well it's probably the last 12 13 years now uh, you know the sound of trey anastasio's guitar tone that is a train wreck express for people who don't like fish which is a lot of people some actively <laughs> dislike <laughs> um there is a great uh, YouTube documentary by Five Watt World where Keith uh, kind of gives the rundown because there's not really a definitive train wreck recording, right? We we right. look at Dumble. You know, Kyle Harris is making a, a killer looking Dumble rig right now. He's doing mm-hmm. a clone, but there's not a ton of. I mean, that's like the sound of Robin Ford or John Mayer or you know Santana, right? But the train wreck is a little more. Uh, I mean, they're just as coveted by a lot of people, but it's not doesn't have like the the mythos surrounding uh, the sound. It's kind of like that great space in between, like an EL thirty four powered Marshall and like a Fender Tweed amp or or um, kind of a black or silver face amp, just pushing to the edge of breakup. So you get a really really great clean sound, and you get a really kind of like saturated squishy overdrive. Um, you can get into high gain territory. But historically, they didn't have master volumes, so and they don't take pedals very well. And that was yeah. one of the things that the builder warned me about. So the 
Original train wrecks were made by a guy named Ken Fisher in the uh, 80s and 90s. He died in 2006. Um, and one of his friends who helped him build the amps was this guy named JM. And at this point, I think it's uh, I think it's public knowledge. His name is John Mark. Um, okay. And he took up building them uh, on a very limited basis in 2009, uh, after, you know, a couple of years after Ken passed away to kind of support the Fisher family because Ken's mom is still around. Uh, so yeah, he's doing them on a very limited, limited basis. Um, you know, the price for admission for like an original spec one is about 10 grand. Um, Oof. yeah, yeah, they're not cheap. Uh, I had a couple mods that I requested on mine, basically a more usable EQ and a master volume since I live in a house with other people like my wife and kids. <laughs> you live yeah. in a town with other people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, um, yeah, I, I put an order in, I waited a very long time for it. It was not 10 grand, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't cheap. And yeah, I, yeah. I just wanted something that was a little usable, maybe a little bit more friendly towards, uh, pedals. Um, you know, so and that's where that EQ shift comes in is just mm-hmm. EQing a little more for pedals. Yeah. And my, my taste is pretty eclectic too. You know, I've got a 335 that I foolishly considered selling, but I had a great buyer lined up and a fantastic buyer lined up. So, yeah. um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I've, you know, anything from a 335 and a firebird, which is still one of my all time favorite instruments to like, you know, I have a Strandberg boat in six and a PRS special semi hollow. So it kind of, my taste varies and you know, I have my musical taste varies. So I want to make sure all my bases are covered. And yeah, the, the express was a great, I mean, it was, it was like a bucket list stamp for me, you know? Like I've always loved those, you know, I, I've seen Billy Gibbons using one. And I remember when I was a teenager, um, when Ken was still alive, just seeing a couple, you know, one of those amps come through. I'm just like, Oh God, that thing sounds great. And like the biggest value prop is how touch sensitive it is. You know, I can have it mm-hmm. screaming with gain. And if I play really light, like on any pickup with any guitar, it just, it cleans up like nothing happened. Um, I have some audio examples of it for anybody who has a quant cortex, who's listening i uploaded the irs of it i built i made them myself using oh. this microphone and another mic so you can get the actual sound of my amp on my favorite settings um and yeah i mean it's just just an awesome it's just an awesome mid mid gain amp you know it, it it breaks up exactly where you want it to you get a ton of definition and that's the great thing about having it be so touch sensitive it's just like it's super unforgiving. So, you know, in, in some ways it's made me a better player just because I don't have the, I don't have the opportunity to screw up as much as I do with something like a, you know, a, I have a PRS HDRX 20, like the little Hendrix uh-huh. amp. And I've got, you know, a giant pedal board going into a, a silver face deluxe I had an orange AD 30 combo, which is like a AC 30 with a little more nut. And then, you know, I've got an AC 15, I've got an Ignator amp and yeah, a bunch of stuff. So, um, I mean, this is far and away my favorite amp. And the cool thing is they don't do serial numbers. So oh. every amp has a name. The first one uh, that Ken ever made was named Sarah, which is my wife's name. So that was clearly out. because I'm not going to redo that. Right. But Caroline wasn't taken, which is my daughter's name. So the back of the chassis is stamped Caroline and then 23, which is the year it was finished. That so, is awesome. That's yeah. a neat little touch. Yeah, I was really, I mean... It also prevents me from getting the urge to sell it because, you know, I wanted to stay in my family for yeah. a long period. My kids are really musical. They're, you know, really young. So having that is really cool. And yeah, I mean, uh, John is still making amps. Uh, I mean, you can get in there for three or four grand um, for like a, you know, a lower wattage like Liverpool. He also does a lower wattage express. Um, I may get another one at some point. It's just, I mean, they're expensive, but for yeah. for that sound there's really nothing else that comes close i mean the clones are really good but you know if you spend three grand on a clone why not have the real thing we'll be right back this podcast is supported in part by string joy strings i'm a snob at least that's what people tell me I'm never okay with good enough, and that's where Stringjoy strings come in. They're better than good enough. They're the best. Stringjoy are making some of the finest strings available today right up the road from me in Nashville, Tennessee. They offer custom sets, balanced tension, coated strings, the works. If you need it, they can probably make it happen. 
you should be using Stringjoy strings. And if you're going to order from them, you really could help this podcast out by clicking the affiliate link down in the description or show notes below. You get amazing strings. I get a little bit of that back to help the show keep going. It's a win-win situation. Get your Stringjoy strings today. I, I do find it interesting that train wrecks haven't quite, I'll, I'll just say quite, reached the like apex of of, of like the rareness versus plus desirability causing mm-hmm. the prices to they're expensive don't get me wrong they're they're wildly expensive but you know i'm seeing dumbles listed for six figures now now mm-hmm. that you know howard passed ken's designs never really achieved that they never saw those kinds of numbers and which is wild because he is easily just as eclectic and sort of mad scientist as howard was yeah sure and go ahead i was just gonna say i don't so i don't really understand and and now they maybe they're a little more approachable because i know you know like like you said there's no definitive train wreck recordings like when i think Mm -hmm. train wreck i think those uh i think brad paisley's tone there Mm -hmm. before he went to dr z and even post dr z because the dr z z wreck was designed in conjunction with consultation with ken fisher yep uh yeah so you know he's yeah comet amps yeah i forgot about Mm -hmm. those so there are ken fisher influence designs like him himself influence designs out there and maybe that's part of what doesn't drive why the price hasn't driven up because there's other ways to sort of get into it uh, yeah, Dumble on the other hand was he didn't work with anybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I you know they're they're start, they're getting there though. I mean, I, I saw one recently sell for seventy thousand dollars. So Oof. I'm like, Jesus, okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, that is bonkers yeah. to me. Just that that entire concept of something going for that much. Uh, mm-hmm. You you YouTube watchers just saw my face light up while I. Uh, pulled up a screen because I feel like I just saw recently a Ken Fisher modded amp somewhere and I do not see it again now. Well, I'm not going to talk about it then if I can't corroborate <laughs> with cited sources. So, but it, I'm I'm seeing like he, he occasionally modded amplifiers too, which was way less common. And so... There was an interesting one somewhere that I won't even mention since I can't can't show it, but it was going for a very, very high price tag for Mm -hmm. amps for guitar amps. But the fact that you can still get the designs granted, not built by Ken himself, but built by someone who helped Ken. So knows the knows the circuit, knows the way it works, knows what he would have wanted to the best you could know. You can still get it. It's still out there. When you told me you ordered one, I remember being floored. I was like, I didn't know you still could. I thought that was gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he makes them on a really limited basis. I mean, make them a, maybe finishing a couple a month. So oh, that, that's still more than I, I really thought he might be doing. <clears throat> yeah, um, and I so. mean, it's it's just him and I think one of his friends. And the entire process was like super involved, right? So like he would call me or email me like all the mm-hmm. time. We I'm I have like a 30 message email thread from John who is like I mean in in terms of attention to detail I mean you that level of service doesn't exist I've worked in the industry since I was a teenager you know all through college mm-hmm. and never worked outside of MI you know musical instruments manufacturing right. pro audio stuff so nobody I've ever met has been uh even close to is communicative and emotionally invested in making somebody happy so if you are going to invest in getting a, a you know a newer train wreck build you're going to get the you know pretty much the best service i've ever experienced including the stuff that i you know the companies i've worked for so yeah, it was that's pretty baller that's away. pretty baller i yeah. do i do training on customer service in libraries and and hearing those kinds of stories really they give me things to talk about and tell you like this is what it means uh i i've been talking about uh yeah, i do this training and sorry sorry patrons i mean sorry listeners i know that i'm going down the this rabbit hole again again um but i talk about i learned a new story when i do this because i talk about nordstrom which is notorious for their incredible customer service like they're one of the known companies that people model and in their early days they 
like early, early days, like they had just come out of Seattle. I think I'm pretty sure it's Seattle. They started in as a shoe store in like 1901. Um, well, they opened the store. I don't know the city, but I have corroborated this to no, be known to be true. It was in, it was like 50 years ago, mm-hmm. but they opened in this former tire store, tire shop, right? They converted it to a, a, a Nordstrom and, uh, not long after they opened, this guy came in with tires he needed to return that he had bought from the store that was there before Nordstrom opened. Nordstrom does not sell tires, never has, probably never will. That's not a thing. But they are so hardcore about meeting the needs of the customer that they refunded the man for his tires that they absolutely did not sell him. <laughs> You'd be high pressed to find that these days. Yeah, that's just not happening. Like that it's it's just bonkers kind of service. And so mm-hmm. I love hearing about companies that still value it that way. And so, you know, you uh you other you other manufacturers that listen to this podcast cuz I know you do cuz I talk to you, uh keep that in mind. Now I'm not asking, you know, I'm I'm not asking I'm trying to pick companies just arbitrarily without targeting anybody. I We'll just say I'm not asking Gibson to refund somebody who bought a Fender Strat kind of thing, you know, <laughs> but uh, that's arbitrary. Nobody will get mad at me for that. Right. Uh, but yeah, take care of your customers. That's Absolutely. a big deal. You know, I work for a manufacturer so, and our, yeah, in fact, I was going to transition there. We're going to we're going to talk about that because um, so we, we talked about Lewitt last time you're on. I use mm-hmm. Lewitt microphones to record this podcast. Uh, I do some recording. There's one on this cab behind me, actually. Um, but literally today, as we're releasing this podcast, y'all are releasing, uh, a microphone that I'm super excited to see. And I found out about it real late in the game. Um, but I'm going to let you talk all about it and tell it. Cause if I tell it, I'm just going to be wrong. Sure. Yeah. We should talk about customer service too. Cause it's been something that's, uh, I've been trying to make a new standard for a lot of the pro audio companies to follow. You know, it's really important yeah. to me too. So we'll go over that maybe later. But um, yeah, we Absolutely. released a limited edition version of the mic that you and I are currently using, which is our best seller. It's the LCT 440 Pure Large Diaphragm Condenser Mic. Um, for anybody who uh, who hasn't listened to the last time I was on here, we kind of went over that in, in some great detail. But yeah. Um, yeah, so this is it right here. The glare from my camera <laughs> kind of sucks, but this is like a dark like an ivy green on the back there's a waveform that looks like a tree and it comes with all the same stuff that you would get with the regular lct 440 so you have a nice box inside is a shock mount that we're using a Mm -hmm. magnetic pop filter right here and a windscreen that philip has on his yeah so um this is our first limited edition product that we brought to market. And why would we make a green mic? There's not a lot of green mics out there. Um, this all started Which is unfortunate, but I know it really is. Green is my favorite color. As you can, um, you might guess with the, I have a green silver sky behind me. Um, <laughs> so like the, this all spawned from a conversation where we were talking about, um, you know, just like doing a limited run of something because we'd never done one before. And obviously it makes sense to do the best seller. Um, and one of the things I really hate <clears throat> in our space and basically anywhere, everybody does it, is greenwashing. Like, oh, you know, check yeah. out our commitment to the environment. We're like, <laughs> we're we're burning three less tires to, to power our <laughs> factories a month <laughs> or something. Uh, we don't burn tires for our factories, just so everyone's on the same page. Very few tires, almost no tires. <laughs> but uh, that's a joke. Only the cleanest burning tires. Yeah, exactly. Uh, th- I mean, that's a joke. We don't uh, actually, <laughs> it's pretty uh, environmentally efficient when it comes to our manufacturing processes. Um, but, you know, there's like, there's all these commitments to say, like, oh, we're going to donate X amount to, you know, this charity or whatever. And, it's nice, but you know, it gets swept under the rug. It's usually seen as kind of a cynical marketing ploy. Um, there's not a whole lot of real action, like nothing. I mean, just exchanging money and you know, kind of continuing your the same behaviors, which you know sucks. So mm-hmm. uh, we want to 
do a few things that really kind of impact um, how we create products and also, you know, like do something for, for the greater good. Um, there's a NGO, a non-government organization called uh, Rainforest of the Austrians. And because we're an Austrian microphone company, it made sense to kind of partner with them. Um, so proceeds from each one of these mics goes to a, um, a land trust that we purchased, kind of pay that back. Um, cause we already bought it, but it's a, uh, it's 30,000 square meters and that's just under eight acres if you're using freedom units. So that's, um, mm-hmm. that's, we purchased that land for the, uh, rainforest of the Austrians NGO and this, NGOs existed for about 30 years. It was started by a bunch of classical musicians from Austria who wanted to do something uh, to help, you know, protect and preserve, you know, endangered rainforest space down in Costa Rica. So we added uh, quite a bit more land to their, um, to their NGO. And, uh, you know, the LCT 440 Pure is the name of the regular mic. This is the LCT 440 Pure Vita because Costa Rica's like national slogan is Pure Vita. Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that was intentional. Um, and like I said, on the back of the mic, you have a nice uh, waveform that looks like a tree, which is really cool. Um, but in terms of longer term stuff, um, it you know, made us think about a lot of the things that we do. Um, we started, and I, it, this is already in action before, um, but in most of our packaging, you'll notice that if you own an LC2440 Pure, the box, the new one, is quite big. And if you've bought one very recently, um, you notice that the box is abnormally large. So that's for two reasons. One, uh, we want to cut down on, um, on like, you know, packaging that, that it's just pointless. So why we make a box bigger, you can use this box. It converts into a desktop mic stand. So if you don't have the means to go out and buy a boom stand or like one of the desk clamps or something like that, you can use this box. It has holes cut in it. You can run a cable through it. It will sit on top of your desk and you'll have a biodegradable mic stand. And when I say biodegradable... That's that's so cool. (laughs) I think that because that's, you know, you buy a microphone, you Mm want to get into podcasting or maybe you want to do something else and uh, you you buy a mic, then you got to go out and find the right stand for it. I mean, which is fine. Mic stands, they they practically grow on trees, go in your Facebook marketplace, you'll find somebody almost giving them away. Mm -hmm. But instead, you can get right going, just convert the box that, let's be honest, uh, us millennials are box hoarders. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just going to sit in a closet somewhere like the many boxes I have in this closet to my right. I mean, and actually, I have to keep the box from my iPhone 5S or whatever from 12 years ago. Because what if I need it? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I think I still have boxes from my Galaxy days when I was using the Samsung phones. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. It's still. Oh, I mean, yeah. I don't know why we do that, but I'm learned behavior, so I can blame my parents. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, in addition to having a box that's reusable and in you know interesting way, all of our stuff coming out now. Um, for most of our products is 100% biodegradable. So the we the cradle that holds all the products in place inside the box that's made of compressed paper, recycled compressed paper. So there's no like plastic or polycarbonate um, holding it anymore. It won't be in the landfill in your town for you know 35,000 years, maybe about a year or two. I think to break down completely. And then all of our plastics are not plastic. If you see this right here, um, read it to the people listening. It says uh, all of our bags, the stuff that our stuff comes in, uh, environmentally friendly. Looks like plastic, but it's 100% biodegradable. So all of our audio interfaces, the Connect 6, um, the LCT 240 Pro, the 440 Pure, the boxes are a rolling change. So if you buy one tomorrow, there's a chance it's going to have some plastic and it might be a smaller box depending on who you buy it from and you know how fast they turn our products. But anything that we're shipping out of our warehouse now and out of our factories, um, you'll see the the new box, which is great. So big fan yeah, of that. I, I love, I love companies that are so environmentally focused and there's several I, that are, I've really become friends with. Um, I love what Grez guitars does with using reclaimed wood instead mm-hmm. of cutting new trees down. I love what uh, Novo does with they have an effort where every month they're donating to plant more trees in uh, deforested areas. Uh, so even though they are using wood they're you know, and they use 
pine for most of their wood, which is a you know faster growing, more plentiful tree. I know because I live down here in Mississippi, which is the southern part of Mississippi is part of the pine belt. And I know how fast those trees can grow and become telephone poles. Mm -hmm. um, and and y'all, we, we use a lot of telephone poles in the U.S. Um, but I love companies that are taking this for, especially in an industry that's so based around wood and or plastic. You know, you've got, there's a lot of that around here, not just in the shipping, but in the, the things people are making. I, I like seeing the efforts and uh, being very environmentally conscious. And when I saw this, that this was coming out, I got really excited about it. Cause I, in fact, I, I messaged you because I was like, Hey, I already have a couple of 440 peers. Can I just donate somewhere? <laughs> and so that's, <laughs> it was just a great way to open this conversation and start talking about this. Cause I do not need another microphone right now. I mean, I always need a new microphone, and that's the problem, but I need to not need new microphones. I'm trying to not have more stuff in my life, Dan. Um, but uh, so I, I like that you're not just doing the uh, biodegradable, you know, environmentally conscious packaging for the one mic that's donating. This is – you're actually taking a proactive approach across your entire line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, some stuff we we have like a polycarbonate case for like our higher end mics, like a, one of those Pelican style cases. So like the ten forty, mm -hmm. which is our thirty five hundred dollar, um, you know, flagship tube mic, and like the six forty yeah. TS, which I know I talked about. It's my favorite product. It comes in a smaller box, and those are just you know covered in cardboard. And when you open the shipping box up, the the cases inside so you know we're, that one you can't convert to a mic stand but you know the the best seller is the 240 440 um i think we're doing the 441 flex if i'm not mistaken but i could be wrong on that i don't remember off the top of my head but i got one of those here which is just a a 440 with multi-pattern so oh uh, yeah it comes out with all the same stuff it's uh 399 um street price but yeah we got plenty of things and then the bag i held up for the people watching that came with the connect six which is our audio interface so yeah it's lots of stuff that uses the new biodegradable stuff that's really rad and and that's we just we need more folks being uh really conscious of this kind of thing because it's it is important and we're you know we don't want to i don't i don't guys i don't mean to go completely uh green party tree hugging on y'all but um i i do uh, acknowledge that we live on a planet with finite resources and we don't need to burn through them all maybe as fast as we are uh and the those things that aren't finite maybe we need to find a way to replenish those faster um and super controversial i know yeah, right. uh, you look at me um somebody's gonna yell at me for being political y'all environmentalism is not political <laughs> it's not yeah it's creating a ton of waste where is you live exactly creating a ton of wastes shouldn't be political and should just be like just don't be a jerk don't make a ton of trash when you don't have to you know it's like exactly Maybe those are the people who complain about picking up their room. Well, you're, you made a big mess. <laughs> I don't need to clean up my room. <laughs> I don't know. Why do I need to make my bed? I'm just going to sleep in it again. <laughs> those people. Actually, that, I, that's me. I have definitely sorry, had that. that's me. <laughs> I've definitely had that conversation <laughs> with my wife. I've de yeah, I've definitely said those exact words <laughs> as an adult. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> probably did two days but, ago. <laughs> Yeah, I can't. I can't remember. I think the only time we make our bed is like right after we wash all the sheets and everything because you have to. You got to yeah. put them all back, and it gets made, and then it doesn't get made again until you wash the sheets again. Oh, I'm married. I have nobody to impress anymore. So why would I? <laughs> I've I've already tricked someone into marrying me. It's, yeah. it's just the way this works. Exactly. You know, I so, look like a total slob. What's your expect? Why don't change your expectations of me? Come on. <laughs> the, the, the ring did not change my behavior anyway <laughs> philip and i'll be starting a, we're gonna be starting a marriage counseling podcast next so man you ever listen to any of those no i why oh, i i did oh it was wild because i was i was going through this whole phase where i was listening to a lot of everything like mm -hmm. what's out here in the podcasting space just in general so i found some really wild podcasts but i found some really good ones too doing that that's how i found things like uh no such thing as a fish and um uh, switched on pop and some other podcasts oh, yeah. that i listen to fairly regularly switched on pop is dope um there's one that Man. i would recommend to you and to the listeners um i want to make sure i get the name right here hold on one second I'm pulling up my library uh one of my favorite ones recently was about all these famous feuds from um oh it's called rivals music's greatest feuds uh so it oh. has everything from like 
Elvis Presley versus Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, the Eagles, which is, you know, 700 hours, um, Dr. Dre versus Easy E, Oasis versus Blur, Oasis versus Oasis, uh, Metallica, Megadeth. <laughs> so all like the greatest rivalries and, and feuds of, um, you know, rock and pop and rap. It, it's really, really good. Um, the Oasis versus Oasis one was fun. Because uh, <laughs> we've all seen that play out in real time over the last 20 years. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it's still playing out. It yeah, is yeah. still absolutely mm-hmm. playing out. So yeah. I I love the Elvis versus Jerry Lee Lewis one, though. It's one of my favorites. Having met Jerry Lee Lewis, I never got to meet Elvis. He he passed before I was born. Um, but so Jerry Lee Lewis uh, lived, I don't know, about an hour north of where I grew up as a kid. So like everybody beyond mm-hmm. the musical legend, everybody knew who Jerry Lee Lewis because he was that crazy piano player that lived in Nesbitt. Uh, basically. Um, and one of my favorite stories that I genuinely cannot remember if I've told on this podcast, because I've told it a million times, and I hope it's mentioned in the podcast, which I have now followed, I'm going to listen to today, um, is uh, when, like, just before, the, like, the year before Elvis did the 1977 comeback special that everybody, you know, was it 77, 76, whatever it was, because uh, I think he passed in 77. Mm-hmm. So it was earlier than that. Whatever year that was, everybody knows. Comeback black, special was black 67. Leather seven. Yeah, 67. 67. Yep. Oh, look at that. Look at 68. Twisting was, everything around. That's all good. So before that, and some people say this was the impetus for him doing it, um, Jerry Lee Lewis got super pissed off at Elvis, which he was usually ticked at Elvis, but um, more so than usual, enough that he was willing to drive his car to Memphis, which was not far from Nesbitt, and drive through the gates of Graceland. Not not wait for them to open and drive through the gates, but literally just drove through the gates, marched into the jungle room, and told Elvis Presley that I'm going to paraphrase, but I'm going to try to get it right. Uh, they call you the king of effing rock and roll. I'm the king of effing rock and roll. I never left. <laughs> and like something to that effect and just got in his face mm-hmm. about it which if you know the history of jerry Lee lewis that's super scary that man as far as we know kill people like we don't we don't know he didn't he didn't go to jail for killing people but there's rumors uh <laughs> and i am not i'm not a lawyer i'm not saying he did or did not y'all you just judge for yourself I love the rivalry between Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis. And we know who won, you know how we know who won because guitar is still the instrument of rock and roll, not piano. It's true. Yeah. So anyway, I, I love that story. I genuinely hope it's true. I don't know a hundred percent that it's true, but it's great folklore. Uh, so I'm going to listen to that. Uh, I do like, I like podcasts too much, which is why I decided to start one. Uh, about guitars and stuff like that. Oh, but other than that, I feel like we need to talk about, I think we're going to get to hang out here soon because mm-hmm. Nam is coming up. Sure is. Yeah, it's going to be a great time. I'm really looking forward to this. I mean, I, I like complaining about Nam to, to my yeah, yeah. you know co- former coworkers and like, you know, networks, uh, network people in the industry and stuff. It's just, we all, it, it's something you always complain about. And then when you get there, you're like, ah, oh, this is great. And it's good to see everybody. Um, you know, there's some great restaurants in the area, and you see a lot of really cool stuff. So, yeah, I, I can't wait to hang out, man. This will be the first time we, you know, we talk a lot. I, I yeah, think, we do. You know, you're one of my friends. So, it's like being able to like hang out in person for the first time is great. I know, um, last time I was out in California was NAM, uh, which was April this past year. They, they're finally yeah. kind of resetting everything where it's in January again. But this past year or this year, yeah, it was in April, and the year before that, it was in uh, June, and that was just basically to kind of uh, slowly reset the regular schedule. Because after you know all the the most serious phases of the pandemic, you know there was no name show in twenty twenty one. Was there? I don't know. I didn't go. So um, in twenty twenty one, I did summer Nam. Okay, in Nashville, and it I, see, and I had no frame of reference because mm-hmm. I'd never been to a Nam. Uh, it's still the only NAM I've ever been to, so this one will be really interesting. Um, but those that had been to NAMs before were like, oh, this is pitiful. <laughs> this is like nothing. 
I mean, Summer Nam is usually pretty lightly attended. Anybody who's launching something really big or if they're local, I mean, Gibson's there a lot of the time. Um, yeah. Yeah, but if if you're local or you have something you're launching that you really want to get a ton of attention on, it's great, you know, but like, yeah, Summer Nam is always generally, you know, much, much, much smaller. Um, it's similar to like an AES for, you know, maybe 10,000 people. I was just at AES last week in New York, which is Audio Engineering Society. They put on their own little trade show. But yeah, Nam this year is going to be cool. Um, we're not going to be showing... Um, our own booth. Uh, we work with some distributors and we have direct, obviously we sell directly to the, you know, the, the big folks, um, you know, right. Zounds, AMS, Guitar Center, Sweetwater, B&H, Vintage King, et cetera, et cetera. But um, with, we use uh, Hal Leonard, who's the biggest music publisher of like, you know, print music books in the world. And uh, they've been, I've worked with them for years uh, through several different companies. So we'll have, we'll have some space there. We'll take meetings there. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it too. Cause you know, the week before I'm going to be going out doing some studio visits cause we're getting some really great placement of our microphones and products in, um, in like a bunch of, you know, legendary studios like East West and like the sound factory. And, um, I got one this morning, uh, my buddy, Matthias, he's, uh, he, he's, I think the general manager of, um, one-on-one -on -one recordings, uh, which is okay. where Metallica recorded Injustice for All, notably the Black Album, and then uh, Dirt from Alice in Chains. So seeing my stuff being used on a grand piano there, he sent me a, a video at like one in the morning. I was asleep. I woke up <laughs> this morning. I'm like, oh, oh that's cool. <laughs> right on, dude. Thanks. This is a great thing to wake up to. Um, but yeah, so we're getting a lot of placement there. So doing studio visits, uh, just meeting up with a bunch of influencers and artists and you know friends that I've made over the years so it's going to be a great trip and then you know like a the week after i'm uh, bringing my family out we're going to go take the kids to disney and go down to carlsbad so i can decompress after a busy trade show but nam is really cool and i think it'll be bigger this year than it was the last two years yeah that's what i'm hearing there was a lot of takeaway positive takeaways from nam last year which i sort of did not expect and actually got positive takeaways from people who have been notoriously negative towards nam mm -hmm. uh you've been to a bunch of nams we've talked about this oh, before. Yeah. i think this is gonna be my like <laughs> 19th nam show that's a that's a lot of trips to california man i'm also 38 so you do the math yeah <laughs> it's I've, I've been going to nam yeah, longer than i've not been going to nam um yeah that so, is absolutely bonkers yeah yeah. Uh, this year was interesting. A lot of people didn't, a lot of like the big companies didn't show. Gibson didn't have a booth. Fender didn't have a booth. Mm -hmm. Yamaha did, but um, that would, they take I, out like, half heard. the Marriott, which is uh, oh, I think one of the two big hotels by the Anaheim Convention Center. So you have um, the Hilton and the Marriott. That's where a lot of people have meetings and stuff. And that's where they'll show, you know, new products. But the Yamaha booth this year was uh, a bit smaller than normal but it was you know it was stunning uh, people spend a lot of money and the other thing too is like the cost of exhibiting at nam if anyone's been in nam or seen the pictures you know some some manufacturers like yamaha or roland fender gibson they'll spend upwards of almost a million dollars on not only just the room but like all yeah. the staffing people ho hosting events <clears throat> taking you know making like experiences within their big rooms and then, you know, for the people who want to spend 7 to 12K, you know, you're in the basement showing off your, you know, your pickups that are made out of, you know, whale bone or whatever. Yeah. And so this is crazy stuff you see that, that it's from all the, and those are always super interesting because you, you see stuff you'll never see in a music store, or at least you will never see in a music store that year. It usually takes some time. Um, but you know, a lot of these, a lot of these small manufacturers of like, you know, really unique, innovative pickups, they'll sell their idea to a bigger manufacturer and they'll never see the light of day in that, in that space. So it's always interesting what comes out. Like, you know, I remember when Chase Bliss first came out with the, um, automaton pedals, right. You know, they're always a smaller boutique yeah. manufacturer, but then seeing that in person was like, holy smokes, like the, you know, the motorized faders are so cool to look at, you know, I'm like when I'm when I first saw it, I was just like, Oh God, I can't imagine putting on a board that I step on. And then it's like, yeah. Oh, it's magnetically driven. So it disengages. So you can hit those, those faders as much as you want. Nothing bad will happen. And they have a great warranty wow. and they stand behind it. 
And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then I think six months later, I bought one. <laughs> so it's on mm -hmm. my pedal board. And I can, I can confirm that after two or three years at this point, it still works great. So no problems. Oh, um, man, pedal board chats, another one we need to get into here in a minute yeah. uh, while we still have time in the main episode. Yeah. But I, I do love that from the stories of Nam. Again, having never been there, I am super excited to meet some people in person, see some people, friends for the first time that I've known through the podcast and just chat with uh, some that I have. Uh, I'm going to hang out a bunch, hopefully with uh, Ryan and Steve from 60 Cycle Hum. And oh, right on. <clears throat> Jason from Working Class Music. Uh, uh, we're, we're talking about sharing a, a space, an Airbnb space, and we'll see. You know, we're working on all those details because, um, you know, I... Uh, Steve, I mean, Ryan makes his living doing this. The rest of us are working folk. <laughs> Ooh, this is this is what we do because we love it, not because we do this for a living. Not that Ryan doesn't love it. He obviously loves what he does, but we do this just because we really enjoy doing it. We're not making a ton of money. Uh, Steve gets a, l a little bit off of 60 Cycle Home, but as far as I'm aware right now, you know, Jason and I, we're still, you know, full-time working stiff suit. That's how we make our living. Uh, working you know the grind every day mm -hmm. uh, so it'll be fun to hang out uh, spend some time really nerding out over gear and uh, fun and getting good tacos for a change um, that's I, I'm honestly more excited about getting great tacos in California than almost anything else that's happening there are some really good places that are a little off the beaten path but you could probably still walk there if you're not too tired I will gladly mm -hmm. give you recommendations and if anybody else wants recommendations oh i need all the recommendations because my yeah. wife and i are going early so we're going to be there a couple of days early have a little time uh she's never been to california and i haven't been in literally almost 20 years as of january so no well, i'm i'm super pumped to get back it's yeah the, a lot of new places have opened up post pandemic too so there's uh, some really amazing restaurants and some really cool experiences just nearby the trade show so we'll yeah. we'll have a great time and yeah man i'm totally looking forward to hanging out it'll be great yeah it's gonna be a good time and listeners if you're gonna be at nam uh message me hit me up on instagram let me know uh maybe we'll do a, a hangout or something one of the nights that i'm there we'll find something to do i'm sure there will be plenty to do and there will be not enough time to do all the things i want to do but that's just you know the way things happen so you're gonna have to just live with with those experiences <laughs> um but as we're talking about pedal boards, because I am literally currently in the midst of like, I've got the itch for a big board again, like a big pedal board. And I'm like thinking I want to do like two tier switcher monstrosity, which if I go switcher, then I start thinking MIDI again. And if I start thinking MIDI now, suddenly I'm like, mm, those Chase Bliss pedals. Mm hmm. They're real tempting. You've tried to sell me on the the preamp Mark II on several occasions. Um, so, how often are you gigging a big board with the automaton on it? I mean, it's my main board, so any gig I do that I'm not playing acoustic. So often, yeah, and you don't, <laughs> and and yeah, and so you haven't found any issues or any worries with it whatsoever. Nope. No, and I got the Maris Reverb they Interesting. did as well. The one, the other one, the the reverb pedal that has the faders as well. Yeah, yeah, the, so, yeah, the CXM. Yeah, the CXM. That yep. yeah, but that's what I mean. It's like it's real tempting, and it's but it's so much money. I have to sell things to do it. I can't afford to just outright do it. And I'm like, is will I really use it? Because I've had big boards before, mm -hmm. but I've never done the two tier board. I've always done. Um, I've always done the, uh, the wider pedal train board. So just everything on top. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't know, it's real tempting. And, and I've been going back and forth over in the discord chatting with people about whether or not, you know, this is because the boards get expensive when you, once you start talking two tier pedal boards, and then mm -hmm. you're also talking, uh, switchers, which are expensive. I, I just don't know that I'm ready for that life again yet. Yeah, it makes sense. Do you I mean, use a switcher for yours? I don't. I have, I, I so the cool thing about the preamp is you can, <clears throat> you have three different banks. There's like the factory bank, there's red bank and blue bank or red or green. Oh God, I don't remember. Um, yeah, red and green. 
and then I can make my banks of presets like mm -hmm. I can assign them to, you know, basically one through zero. So one through nine and then zero. So I've made, um, I set a bank up basically where I usually like to hit my, you know, different settings. Yeah. Um, so like zero will be my most common, you know, overdrive and EQ setting. Then bank or you know, number two will be the high gain stuff. Three will be good for solos. And you can just basically paddle through them. Um, I only have four that I really use four presets that I've made. So it will go one through four and then stop and then basically okay. go back one through four. So it's super quick. You don't need a switcher for it. Uh, I obviously would help if you have like, you know, one of the, with the um, MC six or ES eight from boss or whatever. The MC sits is morning, morning side, morning star. Yeah. Morning star. That's right. Morning side is. A, yeah. I had the, VR. I had the M MC six pro. I mm -hmm. think I'm getting all those letters, right. Yep. Uh, that they released earlier this year. Mm -hmm. um, I had that back when I still had all the Strymon pedals and I was controlling those with it. But then I went a totally different direction. Yeah. You know, shrunk my board down. And so I've been using this much smaller uh, pedal board for a while. But now I'm I'm starting sort of getting the itch to put way too many giant pedals on a pedal board. Um, and so, I, mean, I don't know. It's real tempting to go switcher again. Yeah. I mean, so full disclosure my my main gigging thing now is my mm -hmm. quad cortex right oh, so like you i have become one of them now yeah but the thing is i don't i mean i you my I, the band i play and we use those uh you know the little stick line arrays right so like electric oh, voice yeah, yeah. or rcf i use an rcf one and you know i plug my guitar directly in i get my favorite settings in my train wreck and I've got a great Fender clean sound and I just, I don't have to bring a tube amp out to, you know, a, a rainy gig or like, you know, I can plug my mic in directly into the PA without an amp. Um, and Lewitt makes a great line, uh, a great line of live microphones, which they do. I think are fantastic. Um, but yeah, I use my, uh, what's the one I've been using the 550 DM. It's basically like a, um, like a better version of a beta 58, just a great vocal dynamic mic. So right into channel one on the amp on the PA and then uh, run the quad cortex into channel two. Super easy. I have all my presets for my set list loaded up. I just hit a button to cycle through each one of them. And yeah, I mean, it takes a while to set up, but you know, I don't need to worry about like, Oh shoot, I didn't bring the right phaser. I have to remove the phaser from my <laughs> temple board and put the the other phaser on. I use one of those uh, Tortuga FX uh, standard issue phasers, which I don't I don't think they make those in production anymore. You can get them in the custom shop, but this is an older one. Uh, but yeah, I mean it's it's been super convenient. Um, I mean mainly it's just kind of the QC kind of sits on my desk and is like my recording tool that I like to use. I mean I do the last two gigs I did. Um, I brought the Quad Cortex out and it was fun. But there is something more fun about bringing out my deluxe with my pedal board and just kicking something on. And it is, you know, if I'm not using a house PA, like I'll bring my uh -huh. QC and the stick. But if there's a place that has a PA, I'll I'll bring my amps because that's fun. I'll bring, I mean, it, amp. That, I shouldn't say amps. I, should, I bring them out. My, I have a Silver Face reissued deluxe, which is just a killer pedal platform, basically a basement yeah. tone stack and go direct in with my, with my board. And it does everything I want it to do. Um, you know, for like a brewery gig, we have a lot of breweries in Connecticut cause we have nothing better to do than, uh, make beer and drink it. Um, and I'm not complaining I mean, about it sounds that like all. the perfect place to live to me, but yeah, no, it's, I mean, I'm not moving anytime soon. It's pretty dope, but like the, <laughs> the uh, the, the, the quad cortex just, I mean, it, if I'm going to do a lot of covers or something, it's just a great, all in one. It, it has a bunch of acoustic guitar presets. It has bass presets. It's it's just a great tool. It doesn't excite me the way that having a new pedal does. I just got this, which is an. Uh, I've been looking for one of these for a while because they're on back order with Analog Man. It's the Silver Mod TS9 DX, the, the yeah. uh, Turbo Tube Screamer. This I think is their most underrated pedal um, because it does. Interesting. Yeah, so the Silver Mod is really cool. It does, in the, the TS9 DX, for anybody who doesn't know, it basically takes a TS9, you have uh, your TS9 mode, 
plus which is a little more gain hot which has a little bit more gain and then turbo it's just basically gain staging up adding a little more um a little more distortion to the tone uh not everybody loved these this is unbelievably cool so it has your uh TS9 mode is TS9 plus is like a, mm-hmm. an original 808 with the JRC 4558 chip. Um, hot and turbo have changed to something else. I don't remember exactly what they all do, but I kind of leave it on the 808 with a little bit of a uh, little bit more juice. And it's yeah, I I I cannot recommend these enough. You can buy them new uh, when he has them in stock for like just under 200 bucks, or you can find them on Reverb. I got this one on Reverb for like 120 dollars, and this is like just a total slam dunk yeah so for anybody looking for a, a tube screamer and you don't want to go out and buy a bonsai or you don't want to go out and buy one of the hand wired ones but you want something that does a little bit more than a regular 808 or a ts9 that you can buy strong recommend this and you'll find the silver mod will always say like rej project and we'll say jrc 4558 which is the op amp um that they use very for cool so yeah, uh, I don't work for Analog Man, so this is not a sponsored plug. I just really like it. And he is local to Connecticut. He's down uh, yeah. towards the shore. So um, I, the stuff I will he does always, is amazing. I'll always hype Analog Man because I think he just builds incredible pedals. And he mods. His mods are so good. I've been, I've been, I've been really close. It's been in my cart three times, three different times I've seen on Reverb, one of the TS9s with the Bad Bob uh mod built into it uh and so it's i think it's oh man i'm gonna get this so wrong but i think it's a it's his silver modded ts9 that then also adds inside the pedal a bad bob boost uh and i have almost pulled the trigger on that multiple times i'm gonna end up with one at some point i just know i am um I love I love a good tube screamer. That's just it's fact. I just mm-hmm. I think I think tube screamers are great. And when people ask me, "Hey, who makes the best TS9?" I'm like, "Ibanez." Dude, just buy the Ibanez TS9. But I like the Analog Man because it adds the boost mm-hmm. and basically makes it a dual stage uh, overdrive and yeah. boost in a in a compact size pedal. You don't have to have a big wide pedal. So highly recommend those. Um, so as we're hyping up. Uh, analog man we're approaching the end of this main episode we're going to go over to patreon listeners and we're going to chat i'm going to ask uh dan the question i've been asking all of my uh patreon guests although because dan is a patreon supporter he already knows the question so it's a little unfair (laughs) um so he's had time to prepare for this um but Dan, tell everybody where they can find you. There's going to be links below for as much of this as I can remember to put down there. There's mm-hmm. also going to be a video about the new 440 uh, LCT 440 Pure Vita. Um, uh, but where else can people find you? Well, you can look at us on, or you can find us on Instagram at at Lewitt Audio. Uh, we are www.lewitt-audio.com. And, you know, Lewitt is the official name of the company. So it's not Lewitt Audio, but that's how we have a lot oh. of our stuff signed up, uh, like set up. It's Lewitt all in caps. We're not actually yelling at you when we when we market to you. Our <laughs> name is all capitalized. It's, uh, you know, just internationally, it's easier to recognize. Um, but yeah, and if you own a Lewitt product and you have an issue with it, and this is back to the customer service thing I was talking about, uh, oh, I yeah. have a team of five people in the U.S. So if you're if you contact us for customer service support, anything you need, there is a one in five chance that you'll be speaking to me directly. Um, we have a very flat hierarchy. So anyone from our channel marketing guy who does all of our videos in the U S to the national sales manager, to our artist relations manager, we're all the people that you're talking to. It's not a robot. It's not, you know, like there's a good chance that I'll crack a joke. If you have a, you know, a broken mic or something and we repair it for you or send or get it fixed or replace it. So yeah, uh, you can find us all there. Uh, yeah, and you'll drop the links. So, you know, feel free to check us out. We have a ton of stuff on sale for the holidays. So if this is between the uh, dates of November 1st and January 5th, uh, from November 2023 to January 5th, 2024, uh, we have a ton of stuff on sale um, across the board. So you can hit your favorite retailer and get our stuff at even a, a lower price. Oh, that's even better. Look at that. So listeners, you can click below down in the description or in the episode notes in your preferred podcast player. Uh, Otherwise, you can find it everywhere. And I highly recommend uh, following the Instagram account because uh, 
y'all your team over there uh they do some really hilarious videos um uh, the one recently about taking a microphone soaking it in water uh throwing it down the stairs and then putting it in rice um yeah <laughs> what the hell <laughs> literally my wife watched it with me and she said what the hell <laughs> yeah you know there's no reason not to have fun you know everybody takes themselves way too seriously a lot of the time so it was agreed just enjoy, enjoy the process of recording and you know as things become more and more democratized uh more people can record and we're trying to make a fun like you know lighthearted environment for you to you know be inspired yep I love it. And uh, listeners, that's what I'm doing, too. So hopefully you have been inspired or at least laughed or learned something or had a good time with us this week. I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope you come back next time. Patreon listeners, I'm going to get to see you here. Well, you'll get to hear from me here in just a little bit from the bonus episode that we're about to record. Uh, But in the meantime, the rest of you, uh, if you're not a Patreon supporter, that's totally uh, okay. Leave a review, leave a like, tell a friend about the podcast. That's a way you can support the show without giving up your hard-earned dollars, which I know that we all need a few more of these days. So until next time, be good to yourselves, be kind to each other, and make some noise. This episode is brought to you by the supporters of 40 Watt Podcast over on Patreon. Go over to patreon.com slash 40 Watt Podcast, where for as little as $3 per month, you can help support the podcast and get every episode ad-free. For $5 a month, you'll get every episode ad-free as well as a bonus episode every week. I can't overstate how thankful I am for the support of my patrons and hope you'll consider joining the team and helping keep this show on the road.